A scorched earth strategy is destroying anything that might be useful to your adversary. Food, energy, infrastructure, transportation. You salt the earth, poison the wells. Prior to his famous march to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah during the Civil War, Union General William Tecumseh Sherman was rewriting the textbook on modern warfare, operating deep in enemy territory and without logistical support. His army was disrupting the entire Confederacy, not just the military, but the civilian side as well. The war would be brought to the people. He had presented his controversial strategy to President Lincoln and General Ulysses S. Grant, who, though they had reservations, instructed him to carry out his plan. Caught in that scorched earth policy was the new Manchester mill behind me, as well as the Soap Creek paper mill, both in northern Georgia, along Sherman's route to Atlanta. The Marietta Paper Company ran its operation here at Soap Creek. It was a rag mill with paper being made from the linen rags and old cotton, milled down and reconstituted into paper for writing, tissue, and wrapping. The outbreak of the Civil War changed everything, though. The men employed here were enlisted and the women took over running the facility. Tissue and wrapping paper became cartridge paper. And supposedly, though it has never been substantiated, the mill printed Confederate currency and bonds as one of the South's mints. Similar mills along Soap Creek provided flour and meal for food production. The new Manchester mill here along Sweetwater Creek had a similar experience. A textile mill, it provided clothing, making a steady profit until it was contracted to make Confederate uniforms, after which revenue grew rapidly. In the spring of 1864, the war began to march closer to Atlanta. Sherman had pushed through Tennessee and was en route from Chattanooga towards Atlanta. His scorched earth policies were decimating the means of production while he and his army lived off the land, moving quickly and expeditiously through the Confederates' rear guard. His soldiers carried only 20 days' rations, and men were selected as foragers, or bummers, who would scour the fields, farms, and towns while the rest of the army destroyed any infrastructure vital to the Southern cause, specifically railroads and manufacturing. Bent railroad rails, twisted around trees, became known as Sherman's neckties. Now you can imagine as a resident of this area, life changed drastically as Sherman's army was let loose on your surroundings. This was total war. Grandma was involved and impacted. The northerners spread like locusts, destroying and consuming everything, and it was deeply demoralizing to the civilian population. With Ulysses S. Grant and Robert E. Lee stalemated in Virginia, Sherman knew his campaign could not only decimate the Confederates' logistics, but also the citizens' wills. And most certainly it did. These mills provided for the entire region, employment, welfare, a sense of support for their cause, and in a literal flash, they were destroyed, torched by the adversary, never to return to the capacity they once had, and putting hundreds, most of which were women, out of work and without a clear future. In the end, Sherman's campaign was massively beneficial to the North and equally as devastating to the South. A hero to the Union, he took several major cities, caused untold chaos in the areas the Confederacy deemed safe, and showed an inspiring bravado by marching from the mountains to the ocean clear across the South. To the Southerners, though, that same man was a conqueror, a pillager, a marauder, a villain, as well as a terrorist, arsonist, and thief. Old grudges die hard in some parts of the South. And it is because of all of these things on both sides that he was successful. These mills and many other remains have stood here for 160 years as reminders to a time when total war came to Atlanta and its surrounding area. Thank you for watching. Thanks to my Patreon supporters for helping me get here. And as always, until next time, get lost.